Hello everyone. Uh, today again, uh, I don't have my son with me. He's uh, pretty sick. He caught a cold during a uh, wedding. Uh, he danced a lot, sweated a lot, and ended up with uh, a cold. Uh, you know, so I guess uh, we probably won't see him until next week. Maybe, maybe just maybe tomorrow. Okay. So um, I'll have to carry on the show today, which I think is pretty good anyways. Okay, let me uh, fix all these things that I need here. Um, I looked at the uh, Quora pages and found some interesting questions. Uh, really, they're very exciting questions because it tells you a little bit about how people think, what goes through people's minds, how they were educated, uh, what they learned from high school and college. And, um, and it tells you a lot about authority. And I think you're going to see a lot of that today. Um, uh, how people just memorize and just take as truth what comes from, you know, people who have degrees or, or from the mathematical establishment in general, because, you know, if they all agree, well, who am I to question that, you know, that wisdom? And so uh, I want you to keep that in mind today because uh, the show is going to be a little bit about that. The lecture is going to be about that. It's going to be about how people simply accept things on the basis of authority. And they just repeat them because they read them somewhere or someone told them about it or the teacher told them about it or that's what they studied in college, high school. And they just repeat and they don't even know what they're repeating. And of course, a lot of that has to do with math. So on with the first question. One person asks, how does a wormhole work? Okay. Um, so what is a wormhole? Let's see if we can uh, get an idea here. We have a, uh, an individual who has a uh, bachelor's in science, University of Toronto, and he answers, unfortunately, nobody is sure of the answer. Okay, so he starts out with a negative already with a, you know, with a disclaimer. Nobody is sure of an answer. But we have some ideas about them, wormholes, right? First, Wormholes are, as far as we know, theoretical, okay? Uh, you hear about proof and truth and, uh, you know, uh, what, what, they have, what they know for sure. And then, you know, when you put them up against the wall, they say, well, they're just theoretical. Okay, fine. We don't know if they exist or whether they can exist, okay? And then he gives an answer. He says, wormholes are thought to be special objects where space-time and gravity interact to generate a tunnel that allows one to pass from one part of the universe to another, bypassing the intervening space. So um, this is very hard to understand because... If you're going to go from, say, the sun, we'll call that the first star, right, our star, and we're going to go to star Epsilon, somewhere in the universe, you're going to go in a straight line, and you're going to go through space, okay? You're going to traverse in a straight line from uh, Earth to Epsilon, to this star. And so, how can you bypass the intervening space if you're going in a straight line. You are going already through your tunnel. You're going through this wormhole, in a sense. Uh, there is no shorter cut. Uh, so, so I don't know how you're going to get from A to B, if it's a straight line, in any other faster way. Is there a faster road than a straight line? And uh, we have another individual and he's a uh, physics professor at the UC Berkeley. And he says the following. He says, imagine we are worms on the surface of an apple. And we want to get to the other side of the apple, right? 
Worms do not crawl on the exposed surface of the apple, taking the long curved path. They make their own straight path by burrowing a tunnel through the meat uh, and center of the apple. That is shorter and faster, but more energy intensive. Although for worms, it is nutritional. Okay, great. Now that is standard 3D and not 4D. Why we cannot detect these existing wormholes is because light does not go inside them. So the wormhole, you, you gotta go with your own flashlight because there's nothing there to see. And what extra math is needed? Really none. The burrowed tunnel only requires a belief in space being curved. That's his answer, okay? And uh, what can I say? <laughs> the, the, he, he said a mouthful there, and I'm not even sure how we're supposed to interpret all this. What this guy is saying, he's saying, uh, in fact, I've got a picture of it. I, I did make a little picture, and this is his picture, by the way. It's not mine. Um, where is it? Here. And he shows the worm. Doesn't go around the apple, goes through a hole that's that's the black hole entrance he goes into a straight line if he wants to go to the other side of the apple so um you know he doesn't have to crawl around the apple he goes through it but again we've got the same situation that i just mentioned you got the earth star if you want if you want to look at star to star fine let's go from sun to epsilon okay there's the star epsilon on the other side of the universe and um, you're gonna go in a straight line. You, you set your course, you say, okay, it's over there. And maybe at the beginning you can go around the earth, maybe you get a boost from Venus, fine. But now after you get out of the solar system, you're in a straight line to Epsilon, okay? You're already in a straight line. <laughs> so, you know, uh, you're, you've got a rectilinear itinerary. That's the correct way of saying it. So you're already in this wormhole business. How else are you going to get there faster? Uh, through the fourth dimension, is there a straighter line? If space-time is curved, you know, and, and you're saying, well, you know, it's not a straight line to this place. It's really a curve, but if you go through the fourth dimension, you're going to go straight ahead. Well, you know, this is surrealistic. How, do, how can you interpret that? How can you... How can you present that so that can, someone can understand this surrealistic vision? Are they saying that if I go in a straight line to Epsilon, I'm not really going in a straight line as long as I'm in 3D. I'm going in a curve that turns into a straight line in the fourth dimension. You know, it's uh, please illustrate it for me so that I can follow what you're saying because it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And again, you know, the wormhole is, is one of these um, things that they had to invent to circumvent the speed of light. People didn't like that. They said, you know, how are we ever going to meet the Klingons if, if, uh, if we don't have faster than light? And they said, no problem. You don't have to travel faster than light. You just need a, a shorter road. And, uh, <laughs> and that's what the wormhole serves. It's, it's good for Hollywood. Love it. You know, I mean, I, I like... Uh, fantasy mu uh, movies as much as anybody else but what does this have to do with science you know uh, is Hollywood making documentaries is that what we're saying uh, all these movies are not just flashy movies or documentaries because they reflect mathematics and this is what you gotta uh, keep in mind it's um, it's it's quite far-fetched what they're proposing they're saying this uh, that you know you're you're going in a curve when you go to Epsilon, but if you go to the fourth dimension, you go in a straight line. You figure it out. I, I don't have the intelligence for it, okay? So let me get the apple out of there. Okay, next question. Uh, if you have any questions, just interrupt me, okay? Uh, this is the question. Physics talks on the ceaseless creation and annihilation of subatomic particles. Is this for all matter, all of the time? 
And what is interesting, some of the, uh, one of the answers that was given, and this was given by an emeritus uh, individual at CERN, and he still works there, okay? So this is an emeritus uh, fellow at CERN in Switzerland, and he still works there. And this is what he answers. Um, this ceaseless creation is related to the property of quantum mechanics in which virtual processes violating energy momentum conservation are possible within limits defined by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Heisenberg uncertainty principle means that, you know, by the way, uh, that um, you can't know both the position and the speed or, or momentum of a particle. Of course, you know, that's very simple to analyze. Same with the ball doesn't move, it's standing still, and when it does move, uh, it doesn't stand still. Uh, that's all they're saying. Uh, that's what Heisenberg essentially said with his famous principle. And he continued, probability of such processes depend on the properties of virtual particles showing up in such spontaneous creation, mainly under masses. As a consequence of this quantum phenomenon, no perfect vacuum exists as it is always filled with all this virtual stuff, which has some measurable effects. Okay, so we're talking about creation of particles here, uh, creating particles from the void. That's, that's essentially what these people are saying. And um, what can I say? Uh, please explain the mechanism, the process. How do you create a particle from absolute nothing? If we're going to define nothing as I define it, that which has no shape, how do you have something that has no shape convert into something that has shape? And, and this is the problem. This is, this is the issue. Nobody can visualize such a metamorphosis of nothing into something. And that's why the definitions are very critical. You have to define what you mean by nothing and by something and also, I guess in this instance, you got to find out, you know, what the word creation means. If you're going to create something from nothing, the word creation is obviously just as critical as the others. Are we saying that we manufacture, we make uh, something out of nothing? That's We have nothing here, and now we're going to do hocus pocus, abracadabra, whatever, and suddenly this thing instantly turns into something. This nothing turns into something. And that's what the virtual particle is, essentially. Uh, that's the physical interpretation of what it means. Uh, they're saying that, you know, you can convert something out of nothing. But what is this? This is just a variable that they had to put in an equation. They had to fill in a hole in an equation. They said, look, we, we cannot explain why some, something appears out of nothing. Suddenly we have more mass, more energy, more whatever, more speed, or, or there's a collision, uh, uh, some kind of interaction. And the only way they could explain it was saying, well, you know, a particle was produced out of nothing. And where did that particle go? Is it still in there? No, it, it instantly goes out. It just came in to do whatever we needed to do, it, whatever we needed for it to do, and then it just went back into nothing whatever nothingness is because again you got to define nothingness if the particle comes out of the void and comes back into the void what did it turn into did it disintegrate did it lose length width and height uh, it, this is the what the they have to explain how does the particle go from nothing being a nothing and then suddenly coming into existence and being a something does its little job whatever it's got to do more mass more energy speed interaction whatever it's got to do and then it again comes out it really sounds like a very ad hoc um, uh, hypothesis uh, entity they they it just appears when the mathematicians need it needs it for for it to appear and i think that's that's a serious problem with what they're explaining and uh, the next question, we'll put it in, in the proper focus, okay? It'll explain in the proper focus uh, 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 how, how these things are necessary for the physical interpretations, 
but then those physical interpretations are dismissed as, well, don't pay attention to those. Those are just analogies, or we use them as pictorial representations so that you can understand the math that we deal with every day. But don't take it literally. And you'll see it in the, in the next uh, question here. And the question is, and I shortened it because it, it had uh, another part to it, but is a subatomic particle really a particle? <laughs> is a subatomic particle really a particle? Now, that's a very interesting question. Uh, and this is the answer that some people gave. I'm just going to read it out. This one person who, uh, who tackled and did a pretty good job to represent the mathematical establishment. It's a bit lengthy. I've shortened it as much as I could. It says, quantum particles, subatomic particles have been called particles on an analogy with particles of dust or metal that we experience every day. Again, the word particle here is used as an analogy of what we understand. Like if you see iron filings, you'll say, well, those are particles, right? You see dust in your bedroom, you say, well, those are particles. Well, this is the word particle in quantum is used as an analogy with those particles, okay? And it says, in the quantum world, one can't really talk about a particle without also talking about waves. Because in the quantum world, particles are also, in a sense, waves. So, okay, so we have a particle that is a wave, a wave that is a particle. They're both the same thing and they're both nothing related to one another. One is a wavy thing that of a medium and the other one is a concentrated, in this case, really a point particle, which means it doesn't have any, um, any size, any diameter, any radius. There's nothing there. And they call that nothing a particle. Continues. Unlike particles, waves don't have one specific position. So we have, uh, waves are particles, but they're different, right? Because waves don't have one specific position. What do they have? Well, they're spread throughout a medium. And the wave itself doesn't have mass. Listen to this. And the wave itself doesn't have mass. It's got energy. So particles, they're concentrated, they have mass, energies are spread out, and they're made out of energy, whatever energy is, and they move as a disturbance with a periodic motion through particles. Okay, so we have all this world of particles, and you have this wave that moves through it. I guess what they really meant, or what this person really meant, is that the particles themselves are the one that are waving. Maybe that's what she meant, I don't know. Uh, anyways, it says that waves are made out of energy, whereas a particle, you got to think of it as a concentrated mass. Is, does it have size? They don't care if it does or not. It, all they want to deal with is the mass. They don't care if it has any structure whatsoever. In fact, they clarify it here. As for quantum waves and particles, there is no consensus among physicists as to what they really are. Now listen to that. As for quantum waves and particles, there is really no consensus among physicists as to what they really are. On the other hand, physicists almost universally agree as to the mathematical equations which describe their behavior. So a mathematician is not interested in knowing what things are, even though, you know, in, in rational science, we say that you must have, you must start with an object. You can't do physics without an object. These people are saying exactly the contrary. We don't care about objects. We don't care what things are. We just care about their behavior, what they do. And because we can measure that, describe it with an equation, and then feed it to the masses as truth. That's, that's how it works. Physicists also agree as to the results of experiments on quantum particles and waves, and physicists have been spectacularly successful in applying the mathematical equations and experimental results to the development of technologies. Again, people think that technology is proof of science, is proof of a theory that if you go out there and you can uh, build something then your explanation, whatever explanation you gave it, is okay. It's correct. 
what they're what they don't understand what 99 percent of the people out there don't understand is that the equations you, you can always say that the equations are in in um in uh cord, cord, uh coordinated with technology technology could be a reflection of equations which i think it's the other way around i think the equations reflect what you do in the lab. So there is a one-to-one -one correlation. You say, okay, I saw a behavior, this is the equation, and, and that matches. There's no problem there. There's no problem between technology and mathematics in that sense. That's very different than saying that the theory, the explanation, the mechanism that you're proposing is correct. That's different. That's not what's been proven, but that's what people uh, infer because they say, it's been proven, and we know this because the technology works. Yeah, the technology says that the equation is correct. It doesn't say that the physical interpretation is correct. And you've got to distinguish between those two. Here they give an example. Let's say it's an electron inside a silicon atom of a solar panel. Okay, we have an electron in a silicon atom of a solar panel. A light particle from the sun hits it, and the electron absorbs it. Okay, the electron in the silicon atom of one of these solar panels absorbs a photon, a, a light particle. At the moment that the electron absorbs the light, the electron is thought of as a particle. Okay, so we're thinking of the electron as a particle. It absorbs, there's something there that absorbs light. So at this point, it's thought of as a particle. That means when the person's going to explain, he's going to make an assumption, whether he knows it or not, unwittingly or knowingly, uh, that what he's got there is a particle. So he's making that assumption. It's a tiny point with no internal components. So we have a tiny point, has no point, has no structure, no size, no, no anything, maybe mass, maybe some mathematical nonsense, but it has no, no structure, no, no physical, uh, there's no physical entity there. There's no shape, there's no size, no diameter, no radius. All they care about is the tiny point that absorbed the, the um, uh, photon, and they'll call that thing a particle, okay? And uh, it says, um, at the moment of absorbing the photon, it's a player in our universe and is a particle as opposed to a wave. They treat it as a particle. What is it made out of? Physis physicists can only theorize, and most don't bother doing so. They don't care about structure. They don't care about particles. They don't care about shape. They don't care whether they have an object or not. They don't care about that at all. They care about the behavior. Something absorbed light, and we'll call that something a particle. What is a particle? Well, we don't know what it is. We don't know what it's made out of. We don't care what it's made out of. We don't care if it's, um, if it's got size, it's got shape. We don't care about any of that. All we care is something absorbed light, and we'll call that something. A, part, a particle, okay? And again, it's an analogy because you're not supposed to think of that particle as a little speck of dust or a iron filing or something small, you know, a little ball, tiny bead. You're not supposed to think of it like that. You're supposed to think of it as a point particle that has a position and that because it absorbed light, you're gonna say, well, we'll call that a particle. There's something there. We don't know what it is. We don't care. But something absorbed light, and we'll call that thing a particle. It's a small particle. But prior to an interaction with something like the light particle, our electron is quite different from a particle. Clarification there. It's something like a shadowy undulation around the nucleus of the silicon atom. So we have a shadowy undulation around the silicon atom. That comes from our dear friend de Broglie, who said, you know, uh, the electron really is not localized. It kind of spreads out in um, waves, uh, in uh, integral waves around the atom. And so that's why they have this vision that the electron is not really a pinpoint particle. It's like spread out and we don't know where it's at, and we don't care. We don't even care what it is. We'll just say that the electrons spread out, and that's fine. They can describe it mathematically. The question is, you know, can you draw it? And the answer is no, they can't. They can't tell you what it is because they can't have it both ways. Either it's a, a spread out particle, it's a spread out wave made of energy, or it's a concentrated point uh, made of mass. <laughs> you can't have it both ways. 
Okay, so it says, but, uh, but that's even overstating the level of reality it has. Prior to its interaction and becoming a particle, it's really more like a mathematical equation constantly calculating for itself the probabilities of where it is going to be next with what speed and direction. And again, they're looking at behaviors. They're not looking at what an electron is, and they're going back and forth between particle and wave, wave and particle. When you try to put your finger on the particle, they say, no, no see, it's a wave, it's spread out. And when you point to the, par to the wave, they say, no, see, it's pinpoint, and it absorbed the light. And, and so they can go back and forth because they work with this duality, with this wave-particle duality, wave packet, whatever they want to call it. Uh, they, the the so-called electron is both. And because it's both, they can go back and forth and use the wave when they need the wave and the particle when they need the particle. And that's why they say well, nobody understands quantum mechanics. We don't care if anybody understands it. But the equations are correct, and we can make technology. And again, uh, none of that has anything to do with science because we don't know what an atom looks like still, at least the mathematical establishment. And it continues, upon observing, uh, uh, upon absorbing the light particle, it chooses one of the positions that was only among the many possibilities a moment before. It becomes a particle with measurable properties, including a position. Now that you can measure it, now it, it, the, the wave suddenly collapses the you know the the wave turns into a particle it's a it's a magical thing where this thing that is spread out suddenly concentrates instantaneously into a position because there's nothing there except a position and they finish when in the shadowy state before interaction with the light particle physicists call it a wave they say that it is a disturbance a wave that is propagating through a field but they don't believe that the field is made of anything. So we got, we got so many levels here of irrationality. They say it's propagating through the field. Okay, great. So what is a field? Oh, we don't know what a field is. It's not made of anything, but we'll use this word to show that the electron is propagating, uh, the electron or the uh, light particle is propagating through the field. And, and what is a field? We don't know what a field is, and we don't care, and we don't know if it's made out of anything. In fact, they say it's not made out of anything. So we have this word field that we just introduced uh, just, just to cover the whole. That's all we have. And the field itself is only describable with an equation as to how much, for example, charge it has in different locations. So the field is not made of anything, but it has charge in different locations, different amounts of charge. And what is charge? Well, we don't know what that is either, but it's a number, okay? So we have all these numbers in the field. The field is made out of nothing, and the uh, photon goes through this nothingness, and the photon is not made of anything, and it's absorbed by the uh, electron, which was a wave, but now that it absorbs it, it turns it into a particle. And what is a particle? Well, the particle is nothing because a particle is just a dot, uh, zero-dimensional singularity, maybe, you know, I mean, there's nothing there except the position, direction, momentum, but there's nothing solid there that you can put your finger on. And so they finish it saying, the charge isn't any real substance. So they clarify, the charge is also not a substance, just a mathematical label like plus one. Plus one of what substance? No one knows. And so they say, so when in the wave state, before it interacts with something else in the universe, the term wave is used uh, on analogy with waves of our everyday world, like waterways that do have a medium. So you can see uh, all the levels of irrationality just to explain what a particle is, okay? A uh, uh, quantum particle. Uh, here we have, you know, quite a bit of... Uh, 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 circularity and um, and nonsense really because what they're saying here in, in all these cases is that you you've got you start with a particle and uh, the particle is not really a particle because there's no no something there all we have is behavior we have position we have momentum we have direction we have these kinds of things but there's no real particle there in the sense of a dust particle in the sense of an iron filing that's the first level the second level is that uh, 
the so-called particle, in this case the electron, is not really a pinpoint, but it's spread out until light touches it. When light touches it, for some reason, this wave that is all around somehow, you know, uh, condenses into a single uh, entity, right? And uh, let's see, we got some questions here. Uh, I'll address them in a second. Let me finish uh, my thought here, Martin. Um, and uh, so, so you have this wave that surrounds the atom. Uh, and between the electron and the uh, proton, you have this field. Now you have the field. <laughs> and the field is made out of nothing, but uh, it has charge, which is a number that, uh, with a unit, which is all around the atom, which forms that C. And the charge itself is nothing in, in itself. So we have charge is a number. It's just a number, a value. And charge makes up the field, which is also made out of nothing. And the field is what the uh, photon is going to traverse. It's going to go through this field, but the photon is made out of nothing. It's just energy. And when it reaches the uh, atom, or the frontier, the border of the atom, it finds an electron. And the electron is, at that moment in time, before the uh, photon hits it, it's spread out as a wave. And now that the uh, photon comes in, it suddenly collapses into a particle. And, uh, and what is a particle? Well, a particle has no size, no radius, no diameter. There's nothing there except behavior. And the main behavior is the position. Where is the electron located? Well, who cares? I mean, we don't know what it is. Who cares where it's located? All we're talking about is position, momentum, and behavior in general. So it's irrationality on top of irrationality on top of irrationality. They have no answers to these questions. Okay, uh, let's see. Today, uh, Martin says, yesterday, watch while driving today, watch while drinking beer and whiskey, life is good. Okay, good. Uh, uh, salute. <laughs> Why do you think our mainstream scientists afraid of acknowledging your explanations to their descriptions? You did try to get published, right? Not only did I try to get published, I did publish. I, I published um, in a couple places, and um, I've stopped publishing now because it, 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 it gains you no ground. Uh, you're not going to convince them because uh, as many answer my Quora, answers, you know, they, they give me a reply to my uh, Quora answers. They come in there and they uh, say, you know, that I'm a lunatic, where did I learn science and these kinds of questions. And um, they don't really debate in the sense saying, well, look, uh, uh, there's uh, you're, you're proposing something which is irrational here or there. They, they don't say where you're uh, failing in your reasoning. They don't go with that. They just say, you know, where did you study? Uh, you know, these kinds of questions. And, um, and yeah, and, and that's the same attitude that I found when I go and publish. And I have published again, you know, uh, uh, not in the primary, uh, what they call respectable uh, journals. I published in, um, in secondhand uh, journals. Uh, I published in, in um, Chinese journals. I published in um, uh, one from Oxford University, but it was a lower key. Uh, it was a interdisciplinary uh, type of um, conference. Uh, it doesn't do any good because people don't understand. Uh, unless you create this whole foundation where you say, look, you need an object and because you can't do physics without an object. And you need to know what distance means. You need to know what direction means. You need to know what uh, location means, what motion means, what exists means. When you go into that, they say, well, you know, I didn't come here to take a, an English course. I just want to know physics. And they don't realize that you can't do physics without these words. You absolutely need these words. And uh, so it doesn't make um, any sense for these people to look at some of the things that I write. I, you know, I write in Quora, and I'm sure a lot of these people who are um, into physics, who are uh, PhDs and so on, they read them because I, I get the... Uh, uh, likes from people who are physicists and the majority of them out there probably read them but they probably say oh this guy's crazy because they don't understand that you know science or physics in this case is not about equations 
uh, or about technology. Science is about explaining, and they they haven't gotten that. They, they don't understand. They don't care about that. They don't care about rational explanations. They'd rather say that they don't understand how this universe works and that we can't expect a human to know how this universe works because then we would be gods. We, we would really know, you know what God knows, and that's impossible in their minds. So, no, uh, the way I look at it, they, you know, these people are never going to accept the... Uh, the rope hypothesis. Uh, the rope hypothesis is for uh, very few individuals who um, who are willing to go deeper, who are trying to understand how the universe actually works. And it doesn't mean that I'm right. Again, I'm not here to influence anyone in the sense of converting. What I'm saying is, look, here's a, a different explanation of how the universe works. Take it into consideration. Compare it against the mainstream. And, you know, and what I think I've done correctly is prepare the foundations. Good definition, solid definitions. You can build, you know, physics on top of that foundation. And that's what mathematical physics is lacking. They don't have, and they never will. Not, not if they continue relying on equations for everything and saying that that's science, okay? No, they don't. Um, whether they know the difference between explanations and descriptions, uh, you know, um, uh, there is this um, emeritus professor uh, in Pennsylvania, and uh, Donald Simonick, and and he, he, he I, I like what he, what he wrote. He's it's on the internet, and he said, you know, science is not about explaining. Science is about describing. Now, the first question that popped in my mind when I read that. I said, does this individual understand the difference between an explanation and a description? Because if he says, look, science is not about explaining, it's about describing, it seems like he at least knows that there's a difference between these two words. <laughs> and that's that's a good start. That's a healthy start. But again, you would have to go in there and find out what he means by explain, what he means by describe. Uh, describe, I say, the, that word can only be used to describe objects. When you uh, list a series of properties that an object has, that's a description. Uh, for motion, I like to use the word narrash, narrate, narrash, narration or narrative. In other words, uh, if you're going to explain something, uh, not uh, if you're going to describe what happened, just describe it without explaining uh, the cause if you're just going to describe chronologically how something happened, I call that a narrative. That would be the correct word for behavior, whereas description is the word for objects. You want to describe something, you use adjectives. You want to narrate, you're going to use adverbs, okay? And then explain. Explain is something different. It's uh, you're, you're trying to... Um, um, prosecutor, the person who's giving the presentation, the person who's who's out there uh, exposing his theory, his explanation, is uh, going to try to give you the causes, the, the mechanisms that underlie a phenomenon. And that's an explanation. And that's very different than the description where you just describe a chair and say, well, it's brown, it's got four legs, it's got a backrest, you know, this is a description. And so, uh, you know, whether <laughs> the people out there understand the difference between explanation and description, I'm not so sure. I'm sure that if I go and look at Don, uh, you know, I, I uh, corner Simonek and say, look, uh, you said um, science is not about explaining, it's about describing. What, what is an explanation? What is a description? I don't think he would be able to tell me. I think he, he would not really be able to pinpoint what he meant. But he apparently intuitively thinks that an explanation is different than a description. And that's, again, quite healthy in my opinion. Okay, okay let me go on with uh, the next question, which is uh, quite interesting as well. And uh, <laughs> I, I like this one, and I think you'll love it too. Uh, listen, listen, to, listen to what this guy says. Supposedly this is a 15-year-old, okay? 15-year-old kid. And unless he's a troll or, you know, a, a spammer or whatever. But he, 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 he says the following. He says that he, dis, he discovered something, and he says, will the mathematicians pay attention to him? And, and this is the way he puts the question. He says, 
I figured out an equation for the creation of the universe. I figured out an equation for the creation of the universe. How do I share my research with other scientists? Will they listen to a 15-year-old? <laughs> but I love the answer. The answer says a lot about you know uh, what these people do. Now look at the answer here. Uh, which one is it here? This one. Um, last one. This is uh this is how they answer. Uh, one guy answered, and, and this guy is a uh, what is he? He's an engineer who uh, specializes in physics, and he says, kind of like me, I'm an engineer also. I don't believe you. You're either a troll, a crazy person, or in or an incredibly naive child. <laughs> First thing he says, you know, oh, you discovered an equation. You must be crazy. It's not like, well, let me listen to what you've got to say. Let's see, uh, uh, can you put the equation? Let me, let me look at the equation. No, he says, you're either a troll, a crazy person, or an incredibly naive child. And that is what most scientists are going to think too. So no, they won't listen to a 15 year old and listen to what the, he follows this up with. He says, they wouldn't listen to an adult who claims such a thing either, unless that adult had a PhD in physics and a bunch of well-regarded published papers on related subjects, okay? So, so if you by chance happen to come across the equation that solves, I don't know, the gut, the grand unified theory or whatever, they're not gonna listen to you any more than they're gonna listen to me uh, with a rope uh, model and, and it doesn't matter if you're a 15 year old or an, an adult, uh, what you gotta have is a PhD in physics and a bunch of well-regarded published papers. Those are the preconditions. Otherwise they won't even look at your paper. They won't even analyze it. And he says, unless, unless you can use the equation to make a prediction. But he already threw your paper in the trash can. He, he didn't look at the equation. He says, I'm not even gonna read it. But now he says, unless your equation can make a prediction, okay, uh, get it out of the trash can and read it, okay? If you use it to predict something that wasn't already known or predicted by existing theory, uh, and if the correctness of your prediction can be verified by observation or experiment. So, um, so now you pull the paper that you threw in the trash can because the kid said he's only 15 years old. Now you say, okay, let's see. Let's see what he's got to say. Uh, oh, he says he can make a prediction. Okay, let's see. Can he predict something that was uh, already was not already known by existing theory? And can we verify it through observation or experiment? Okay. This is the essence of science. In other words, his essence of science is that you got to have an equation that can be confirmed through um, uh, measurement, I guess, right? Uh, through observation or experiment and make a prediction of something previously unknown and then show that your prediction is right. So we're talking about what is right or wrong. Then they'll have no choice but to listen to you. Indeed, they'll worship at your feet and give you a Nobel Prize. Of course, if your prediction is wrong, then you're wrong and they'll all know it. That was the answer they gave. And this is, I think, uh, what these people have in mind. So when you, when you ask me, you know, Will anybody pay attention to the rope model? Well, they'll say, who are you? The first question I ask is, what are your credentials? And I'm saying, what does it matter? Look at the theory. You know, what does the theory say? You know, I don't go to Einstein and say, uh, who are you? In fact, they never asked them when he published his paper in 1905. They didn't ask him to say, who are you? Well, uh, I'm a clerk at the uh, patent office. Oh, we're not gonna listen to you. Yeah, I mean, that's what would have happened if they just went by who he was. At that moment in time, he was just a patent clerk. And so you're not gonna to listen to him because uh, he's just a patent clerk. It doesn't matter whether he's got a rational theory or a perfect equation or whatever, you're not gonna to listen to him. And this is, this is the attitude. One day uh, I was in a um, debate in a uh, forum well, for, for quite a while and I remember one of the uh, participants there said the following. He said, you know, I'm a, um, I'm a peer reviewer in a magazine. He didn't say which one. And he says, you know, if a paper comes to my desk that 
proposes a classical mechanic solution to something, I instantly throw it in the trash can. He says, I don't pay attention anymore to classical mechanics. And uh, the word I use is uh, classical mechanics is rational mechanics. It's uh, mechanics based on objects. Uh, uh, whether they uh, knew it or not, they introduced words such as mass and energy and those screwed up everything. But uh, up until the 19th century, people were still trying to figure out uh, what were these invisible things. You know, people like Faraday try to figure out what was underlying magnetism. Uh, uh, James Maxwell tried to figure out what was underlying light. They said, well, it's an electromagnetic wave that has this uh, uh, modulation, this uh, vibration, this, this waviness to it. That's, that's all we know. We don't know what it is, but this is what it's got. And uh, so this is what makes you think that at least until that point, they, they were still interested in knowing what it is. Uh, when um, uh, Perrin in France and later on um, uh, Thompson in England came up with the electron, you know, they, they used the cathode ray tubes to figure out which way, you know, what the atom was made out of. And first they discovered that they had these negative particles, but they were thinking in terms of particles, at least real particles, little balls. And, uh, and then that's how they named the electron. They said, look, there's a little ball, it's a negative ball, and uh, this little ball goes across the tube and, you know, hits the wall, the positive wall, the anode. And uh, so, so they were thinking in real terms. But, you know, after quantum came into being, they forgot about all that. And this guy kind of reflects that saying, <laughs> he's saying, you know, I, I, I'm not going to pay attention to any uh, uh, classical mechanics kind of thing. I only deal with quantum mechanics because all the other stuff is already nonsense for me. It's kid stuff. It's stuff you learn in kindergarten, and I left that stuff years ago. I'm, I'm past college. I'm in the university. I'm beyond the university now. I'm a peer reviewer, and whenever I see a paper that talks about, you know, uh, things, simple things, you know, like electricity and magnetism, I just throw it away. So that's, that's the attitude. And that's what this guy essentially answered to this kid, if, if it was a kid. But the question is important because I don't care if, if, if this guy was a troll or what, but he says, you know, uh, that he's, uh, uh, where is it? Uh, here it is. He says he's a 15-year-old and he found an equation and um, he says, how do I share it with other scientists? And, they, and this guy just, first thing he says, oh, they're going to throw it in the trash can. They're not going to believe you because you don't have the credentials. So we start with credentials. If you don't have the credentials, we're not even going to listen to you. Now, if you have the credentials, well, we might take a look at it, but you better have a prediction uh, of something we don't know, and we should be able to verify it in the lab or you know, through observation or through experiment. So those are the steps, and that's what they call science. Uh, chemistry is mechanics. Yeah, Martin, uh, chemistry is mechanics, but... Um, Remember, uh, you know, when you get down to, to the nitty gritty, uh, these people rely on the quantum folk, on the theoretical physicists to tell them what an atom is and how it's behaving, all that stuff, because they have the equations for that kind of stuff. The chemist, uh, you know, I, I took a lot of chemistry in, in college and um, uh, what you study is, you know, uh, something else. Uh, chemistry is about, you know, putting atoms together you don't go into the the nitty gritty of you know what does the electron do all that you don't, you don't care about that because chemistry really deals with uh, you know putting atoms together and forming molecules and putting molecules together to form you know organics and inorganics and this kind of stuff so the chemist is not a theoretical guy in the sense that he goes into the you know what is the electron doing in there that's that's what the theoretical physicist does and you know they, they have their equations and the chemist de relies on this other fellow you know so it's not like um the chemist has a, th a theory all uh, he's not an armchair theorist he doesn't care about that he's into a different world and he's also more closely connected to um to ex experiments labs and to developing new products what, what do chemists do or where are many of them 
uh, hired or where do they work? Well, some of them are biologists. They also work with chemistry. Others uh, develop products for companies. I mean, where does a chemist work? They work in usually in research and development labs, and a lot of those are privately private companies. You know, they work their research and development uh, sections of you know companies that develop products. So a chemist is not a theoretical physicist in that sense. He he does not deal with at the atomic level or even at the subatomic level. I don't think I, I, I'm not sure, but I don't think you'll find any chemists working at CERN or at uh, SLAC, you know, the, the Stanford Linear Accelerator or Fermilab or any of those places. You, you won't find, I don't think you'll find chemists there. Uh, you might find some at NASA, and again, they would be developing things for space, like, you know, chemistry as related to um, maybe Mars, you know, the Mars atmosphere, that kind of thing. But otherwise, the chemists don't, don't get involved into the subatomic world. No, not at all. They don't care. They'll, they'll just accept whatever the theoretical physicist feeds to him. And they're satisfied with that because they don't care about that. They're, they're going to put atoms together based on valence band, ionic ba uh, bonds, and uh, metallic bonds, that, that kind of thing. You know, they're, they're into something else. Okay, so we go on with the next question. Uh, here, we got a couple minutes more. Uh, why must there be a graviton? I understand that an interacting field requires a boson under uh, quantum mechanics, but can't gravity just warp space-time independently of quantum mechanics theory? And th this kind of relates to string theory because string theory is trying to put them together. Uh, string theory, remember, is an attempt to um, uh, 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 merge quantum mechanics with general relativity. General relativity says that gravity is the warpage of space-time, and quantum mechanics can't work with continuous structures. It works with discrete little balls, and a discrete little ball is supposedly, you know, is supposed to deliver pull. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I cannot visualize it, but maybe someone else that's smarter than me can, and uh, it delivers pull. So you have a baseball that hits you, and instead of pushing you away, it pulls you in. And that's what the gluon does, which is not a, uh, a graviton, but it, it does the same kind of job. It, it works be, between quarks. It pulls quarks together, holds them together as very strongly. That's why it's a strong force. And the graviton is supposed to do the same thing. It's supposed to hit something and pull it inwards. Uh, it delivers negative momentum. So uh, now the question is, that's the quantum side. General relativity says, well, you know, uh, gravity is the warpage of space-time. What does one thing have to do with the other? How are you going to merge quantum mechanics with general relativity? And the string theorists come in and they say, well, you know, we're going to try to develop equations that merge them together. But we have a problem with the conceptual part. Because if one is the warpage of space-time and the other one is a, a deliverer of, of force, it delivers force, and there's no force in general relativity, then how are you going to merge them? Uh, they're conceptually irreconcilable. You, you cannot put them together. You cannot blend quantum mechanics with general relativity. Uh, the mechanisms are different, uh, propose, the two proposals there. And... Uh, and so there is no answer to that question. I think the, the only thing that this gut, the grand unified theory that's supposed to merge them together, that uh, string theorists are uh, trying to develop, all it's done is give jobs to mathematicians that specialize in nonsense called string theory. And again, the word string is also misleading because they're talking about lines, not strings. They're talking about one-dimensional lines flexible lines, and those lines are made of points, and those points are the ones that are going to be the, um, uh, the particles that quantum has, and somehow these lines, you know, they stretch out and they form this surface, which is going to be space-time. So, you know, uh, again, uh, are we supposed to say that along those lines, there's going to be a pull force, uh, 
made of discrete little particles, gravitons or maybe Higgs, uh, that somehow pull, you know, again, that, that violates quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics says it, it goes and delivers negative momentum. And the other guy says, oh no, forget about that. It's the warpage of space time and that the object falls because of the depression and that's the attraction of gravity. So there, there's no way you can reconcile them. It's just absolute nonsense. And whatever equations they develop over there in string theory uh, is not going to merge the two together. You know, never the twain shall meet. Then, is there a connection between music and chemistry? Music. I'm a musician. You know, in fact, that's what I wanted to be, a musician when I was a kid. And I played the violin for seven years. And then I moved on to... Um, to the guitar, that's what I do today. I just do guitar. I haven't done violin in a hundred years at least. And, um, you know, I learned uh, quite a bit of music. I learned uh, in Argentina, especially, we have what is called solfeo, something that is not taught in the States. And you're supposed to um, read the notes and, uh, you know, you have to cross them with your hand and you have to uh, start reading like, uh, we use we, we use the do re mi fa sol right we don't use the a b c d e and so we go do re mi fa sol la si do and we gotta read the music from a sheet and be able to give it the right amount of time and so on and you can have um, uh, that's you know that's a four by four then you have the three by four you have a two by four up and down you've got all these um, these beats okay and we've got to learn all that stuff I learned a lot of that stuff and when you look at that the notes you know how you can relate that to chemistry mm, I, I don't see any connection whatsoever what has to do with sound and the fact that you designate notes to represent certain values and a pentagram right uh, the the lines that you know that where you put these notes and uh each one of those represents a sound that's all it is whereas chemistry is you know atoms that um in their outer shell usually like covalent bonds ionic bonds metallic bonds they're, they're all uh, external uh touching of two atoms that's why the rope hypothesis uh, uh, depicts this quite well, the merging of the outer shell. Even if the atom is a big atom, you know, take iron, take lead, whatever, it's got a lot of layers in it, but only the outer shell is the one that's going to make connection with the other one. How would you explain that with particles? If all the particles are just swirling around, why doesn't, and an atom is mostly empty space, as Mr. Um, um, Rutherford told us, why can't two atoms completely merge almost to, to be one, right? And all the electrons would uh, fill the, the orbitals of the other atom. Instead of having one, you'd have two, three, four. Uh, what prevents it? What physical entity prevents a uh, one layer to have more than two electrons? Why, why not have four in there? You know, why can't you? On the other hand, with the, with the shells, you know, if you have shells, you say only the outer shells touch each other, merge, because, you know, that's where the uh, threads merge and blend and form this object that chemistry uses quite well because they do have the structures of these atoms. And uh, if, you look at, if you look up um, uh, on Google, uh, look up the Orbitron, Orbitron. If you look up the Orbitron, it shows you the different atoms and how they're structured. And what they've done is depict the rope hypothesis. You see the atoms made the way they really probably are, which is, you know, shells. And you have the, uh, the S shell, you have the P, one, P uh, X, uh, Y, Z, you know, you have all these different layers uh, the different um, orbitals, which are really balloons, and the balloons are made of thread. And now you can see how, you know, a P thread can merge with another P thread and form, you know, some kind of molecule. So, so the, uh, you know, chemistry in that sense is separate from music. I don't, I don't see 
how, how one thing is related to the other, okay? Uh, I don't see any chemistry uh, other than maybe the chemistry inside your body. You know, you, you listen to music and there's some chemistry going on in there and say, okay, I analyze the music, the sound. That, that's the only context I can say in which they are merged. Unless you know of another one, maybe you're smarter than me and, and you figured out something I don't know, but you know, I, I, I can't imagine how music is related to chemistry otherwise. Not, not in notation, not in uh, c conceptually. There, I don't see any connection. Okay, we'll see you tomorrow, guys. And maybe I can get my son back, but he's uh, he's in bad shape. He's he's got the flu. He he got a cold the other night during the wedding. My second son got wed, and I'm gonna be uploading a a video on that. And um, and so he, he got a cold, and uh, so he's recovering from that. I, he's still in bad shape, but hopefully by tomorrow he's a little better. But I, I wouldn't count on him until Sunday, for sure. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow, guys. Bye-bye.